Okay, so Romans 10, faith and works, we've covered chapters up to now, but this has the same major premise that the other one did, which is God saves both Jew and Gentile in Christ. That's the bottom line. That's what Romans is about, in summary. <laughs> God saves both Jew and Gentile in Christ Jesus. Okay, phone is now on silent. Sorry. So the first thing is Romans 10, verses 4 through 5. We had covered up through 3 last time because I believe that those verses go with chapter 9. Romans 10, verse 4 and 5. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness based on the law that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. Now, first thing to say is, again, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. We have spoken at length about Abraham believing God and having that count for righteousness, and that that is how we are saved, too, when we have faith in God. This faith is shown when we are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins. In that, you obtain righteousness from God. So Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. You know, Jesus himself said, the law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, everyone forces their way into the kingdom. So... That's the first point is, well, Jesus is the, the end of that law, the point of that law, perhaps you would say, or the purpose of it. Both Jew and Gentile are saved today in the same way in Christ Jesus. And in support of this point is the 11th through the 13th verses of Romans 10. The scripture says everyone who believes in in him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's Romans 10, 11, 12, and 13, which you may recall in Acts 10, when Peter went to the household of Cornelius, he said, I now perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation, whoever fears him is accepted by him. So he came to realize that, which is written right here. There is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who calls on him, or on all who call on him. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, in this place, there is a, again, the important analogy is there's no distinction between Jew and Greek. That distinction is being drawn here between the law of Moses and the faith of Jesus. Jew in, is to Greek as law is to faith. That They believe in him, and they are the ones who are not ashamed. There is no distinction between Jew and Greek, because the Greek is not keeping the law of Moses, but there's no distinction between them. The same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him, because everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Not just the Jew, but also the Greek. Not through the law of Moses, but through the law of Christ. So this quotation we will look at. Everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. It's First Peter 2, 6 through 10 is where I'm going. It stands in Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious. Whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe. But for those who don't believe, quote, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And, quote, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had received no mercy, but now you have received mercy. 
So Peter is quoting a whole bunch of different things there, many of which we have already covered in previous lessons, so I won't go into detail here. But what we're getting at is everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. This comes from the place where he said, I lay in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, precious, chosen. For those who believe, they'll not be put to shame. For those who don't believe, the cornerstone is the stone the builders rejected. It's become a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. Um, now, uh, the quotation is from Isaiah 28, uh, verse 16. And I note in Isaiah 28, 16, this is kind of an aside, but I think it should be said. Um, my version says, uh, whoever believes in him will not be in haste instead of will not be put to shame. That is because the, uh, the Hebrew text from 920 AD says, will not be in haste. But the Septuagint translation um, says, will not be put to shame. Um, which is older than the 920 AD. So something happened in between here and there, and it's clear that in the New Testament days, what it had said was, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Uh, between here and 920 AD, that one got changed a little bit. Joel chapter 2. Verse 28 to 32, we read about this from the prophet, which may be familiar to you. It shall come to pass afterward. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old man dream dreams. Your young men see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I'll pour out my spirit. And I'll show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire, columns with smoke, the sun and darkness the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it will come to pass. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's the one that's getting quoted. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be those who escape, as the Lord has said. And among the survivors will be those whom the Lord calls. Again, this is the passage in Joel where he said, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Then, in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit comes upon the apostles, Peter stands up in the 16th verse and says, This that you are seeing is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And he goes on to quote the passage we just read, Joel chapter 2. The conclusion Peter draws in Acts 2 is our conclusion as well, verse 36. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ this Jesus whom you crucified. The conclusion from Peter is, Israel needs to understand, this is the Lord, this is the King, Jesus is. It's back to what we read in Romans 10, court. Christ is the end of the law of Moses for righteousness to everyone who believes. That's, we've gone a long way around here, but actually it's more of a long way through. We've been reading the verses that are being quoted and seeing how they're tied together to make this point. So when he said um, in Romans 10, verse 13, for example, or even 12 to 13, he, he's the same Lord, Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's Joel 2. When he says that from Joel 2, he knows already that Acts 2.36 and or Acts 2.16 has happened. He knows that Peter said when they obtained the Holy Spirit, that was Acts, or I'm sorry, that was Joel 2. So to quote from Joel 2 in this context, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. There's no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all. Bestowing riches on all who call on him for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It's clear. He means in Jesus. Because immediately in Acts 2, of course, the crowd said, what do we do? And he said, 
be baptized, you repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sin. That's hasn't that hasn't changed. That's what we do. When Paul says these things in Romans 10, it's clear he has reference to obedience to the gospel of Christ. That's how everybody today is saved, Jew and Gentile. Which is why he goes to the 14th and 15th verses of Romans 10 with, How then will they call on the one in whom they have not believed? How are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? How are they to hear without someone preaching? How are they to preach unless they are sent? That's talking about sending gospel preachers, supporting them, sending the word out so that people can believe and obey. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news, which is beginning to introduce a different topic. But his point is the same. This is the word that is going forth in Jesus that saves the whole world, Jew and Gentile. And it must be supported and it must be sent. The next thing to look at is to move back a little bit here in Romans 10, looking specifically at verses 6 through 10. Um because this is a different passage, uh, or I'm sorry, this is maybe a different point that we should look at. The major premise of Romans 10, 6 through 10 is this. Um, it's not too hard. Uh, and that's all they're saying. This is not too hard for you. You can be saved. You can obey the gospel. So in Romans 10, 6 through 10, the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, says Paul, or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead, says Paul. But what does it say? The word is near you in your, mark, in your mouth and in your heart, that is, the word of faith, we now proclaim, because if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe with your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. With the heart one believes and is justified, with the mouth one confesses and is saved. That's Romans 10, 6 through 10. Now, um, the righteousness based on, based on faith says, don't say who will ascend into heaven, who will descend into the abyss. The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. The point of the passage is that this is not too hard. This is the meaning of it. Deuteronomy 30, verses 11 through 20, is the passage, and I will read it because we ought to. Listen to what Moses tells the second generation. Deuteronomy 30, 11 through 20, this commandment I commend you today is not too hard for you, neither is it far off. It's not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend to heaven for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us and bring it back to us that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very near to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you can do it. See, I've set before you today life and good, death and evil. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, I command you today by loving the Lord your God, by walking in his ways, by keeping his commandments and his statutes and his rules, then... You shall live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering. Take possession of it. But if your heart turns away, and you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods that serve them, I declare to you today, you will surely perish. You will not live long in the land you are going over the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today. I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice, holding fast to him, for he is your life and length of days, that you may dwell in the land the Lord swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. 
this is the passage. This commandment that I command you today is not too hard for you. It's not too far off. It's not in heaven that you need to say who can go to heaven and get it for us. It's not across the ocean. Who will go across the ocean and bring it back for us? No, it is very near to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you can do it. That's the point of the passage. That's why Romans 10 says what it does. In 6 through 10, the righteousness based on faith says, don't say who will ascend into heaven. To bring Christ down? No, Christ already came down. Who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead? No, he's already resurrected from the dead. What does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth, in your heart. But that you can do it, is what the text said. Here he said, the word of faith we proclaim. If you confess with the mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in the heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. He's quoting from the passage that said the word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. Meaning you, you know this word, you know this law. If you confess with the mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe with the heart that he's raised from the dead, then you will be saved. With the heart one believes and is justified, with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Meaning, by you know, it, it's still part of the bigger picture. There, there is a righteousness that comes by the law. There is a righteousness that comes by the faith. This faith is saying the commandment is not too hard for you to do, and the word is near you in your mouth, in your heart. If that's where it is, then you are going to be saved. Whether you are Jew or Gentile, implied. But this is the meaning of the passage. Now, I do want to take a moment to look at some of the things that it does not mean. Um, I know that people like to come here and grab one or two of these verses, specifically here, if you confess with the mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe with the heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. People take that verse alone as though it were a formula for how to become a Christian. Well, this is a mistake on many levels. One of them being this isn't about becoming a Christian. This is not about, that's not what this passage is about. This is saying there's a difference between the way people are saved under the law of Moses and the way people are saved under Christ. But there are more mistakes than that one. This is a letter that is written to people who are already Christian. They don't need to be told how to obey the gospel. They have already done so. It's not a prescription for that. The other problem is not evident in the translation. But these words are actually all of them in the errors, which means it should say, if you have confessed with the mouth, and if you have believed in your heart which makes more sense given that he's talking to christians doesn't it they just don't translate it that way you can be the judge of why they choose not to do that but there are a lot of reasons why that's just not at all what we're talking about here it's saying that we have faith in god the way that abraham had faith in god and in the same way that Abraham was justified by means of that faith or, or saved by that faith, we also are being saved by our faith. But Abraham was also justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son, James 2 tells us. And so we also, we believe and we are saved. God counts you righteous, meaning he believes that you are righteous until you prove him wrong. But when you live right and you make good choices, then you are justified. Not just were, were you saved, but now it's justified. As in, yep, that was right. He does love God. She does follow God. That's what happened to Abraham. God considered him righteous, but then he tested him. 
And when he was tested, he offered his son. He was willing to do it. And then he was justified. That's James 2. That's what happens for us today. We also were saved, and then we are tested. But, again, going into the testing, remember Deuteronomy 30.11. This commandment is not too hard for you. He doesn't give us something we cannot accomplish. Something that we cannot do. He's given us a word that we can understand, that we can follow. He's given us a, a mediator in his son Jesus that we might pray and have the help that we need to overcome temptation and accomplish the will of God. We'll pick up at this point for the next opportunity because Romans 10, 16 begins a new idea that carries forward into the 11th chapter. So I'm going to stop right there. Um, today, if you're not yet a child of God, we have just read the things that you need to do to become a child of God. To, we'll help you to obey him in baptism. We'll help you to become what you ought to be in the Lord and to have forgiveness and to rejoice with you too. Christian friend, are you justified? Have you stood up for God and continued to work for God and to accomplish his purposes in this life with the blessings that he has given you? Time and health, opportunity, um, many different things we have from God and they've been used for his purposes. If today we can help you with our prayers on your behalf as a Christian who has not lived right, we're glad to do that to help. We all of us need prayers from time to, uh, time to time. If today we can help you to obey the gospel or we can help you with our prayers, please let your need be known now by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song of invitation. Uh,